Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing this beautiful Sunday morning? You're doing good? Did you get a good nap? Sorry, not a nap. Good night's rest, right? Good night's rest. Yes? No? Is everybody still sleepy? Yes. <laughs> All right. So what we'll do today is um, we're going to sing So I Surrender All is going to be our first song. And what we're going to do is uh, for this first song, we're going to have our guests remain seated just while we sing this first song. And the ushers are going to find you and give you a connect card if you can. Just fill it out, uh, give it back to us, or when you leave, just put it in the boxes back there. If you don't want to do that, you can go and fill one out after service, or even just go online and hit the uh, connect with us. And all we really want to do is just love on you a little bit, find a little more about, about you, and just welcome you into our church. And that's all we really want to do. Uh, so right at this time, we're going to have all of our uh, regular church members stand, and we'll go ahead and sing this song. And all to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily Surrender all, right? Man. So we can go ahead and have our guests stand up on this next song we're going to sing here. Just kind of join us in if you can. It's just the waves of grace. And never forget this song, just the waves of grace. So every footprint of my failure, I always remember that, that one picture that uh, is always hung on my mom's uh, hallway wall, and it showed one set of footprints. It said even during hard times, like, Lord, where were you? He's like, through those times... That one set of footprints was me carrying you. So don't forget that as you sing today. Just sing out to the Lord. For every footprint of my failures, all my doubt and disbelief, there's a tide of love in me to wash it out. an ocean with no boundary, but you're invading every shore to sweep away my sin forever. It's not mine anymore. Here we go. And away. overwhelms me and I'm swept up in you 
are crashing on me. Your cross has washed my guilt away in a waves of grace. And your cross has washed my guilt away in a waves of grace. Amen, right? song is something else but this next song if you guys ever heard of available i know rebecca sang it a while back and man it's it's an amazing song as it slows down but it's, it's saying lord here i am i'm available use me and just as we were talking about in the, in my my kids class today we were talking about being fishers of men and that all he wanted those those uh, men to do on that sea was to put their nets down and to follow him and be willing just be available and offering yourself to say, Lord, here I am. I'm, I'm not the wisest. I'm not the, the most amazing worker in the world. I, I, but Lord, I want to be used be, by you. I want to be available. And that's what I told my kids. said, if you do that, the Lord will give you words. He'll give you wisdom. He'll give you everything you need to be exactly what he wants you to be. So just be available. That's what this song's about. So just sing it with us here. Narrow as the road may seem, I'll follow where your spirit leads. Broken as my life may be, I will give you every piece. I
You're the one who gave me life. Nothing is a sacrifice. And use me how you want to, God. Have your throne within my heart. Got a friend closer than a brother. There is no judgment. Oh, how he loves me! I've got a friend, and he is my strength, and he is my portion. With me in the valley, with me in the fire, and with me in the storm. Let all my life testify. Really loves us. 
Dear Heavenly Fathers, we just thank you for today. Lord, we just want to thank you for the many blessings and the song that you've given us. Lord, I pray that it might have moved our hearts and uh, just changed our way, Lord. I pray that uh, you just be with Julie in this next song she brings. Uh, just sing through her, Lord. Be with Pastor as he preaches and speak through power with him. And Lord, may our hearts be moved and changed and uh, may we just leave here not the same, Father. We love you and do thank you. In Jesus' heavenly name, amen. Celebrate Easter. Everybody comes to church with a smile. Everybody goes on Christmas. The truth is, church is a rally. And we're here to go out and tell others. Because what was the one mandate that Christ gave us? Go and tell others about me. And that's the name of this song. It's called The Commission. Go. Miss Julie York and uh, Brother Greg, thank you so much. Man, it's good, good to be in the Lord's house this morning, amen? The music has been a blessing to heaven, it's a blessing to my heart. 
I find myself just sitting back a little bit, enjoying, just enjoying the song and the music and the love to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Well, you are awful quiet this morning. How many have been in trouble in the last week? Anybody? Bert, raise your hand, the right hand, now your left hand, won't you, so they know you meant it. Amen. Well, good morning. We are happy you're here. Glad you're with us. Glad for our friends and folk that's been coming in a few weeks. I'm keeping track of some of them. Uh, Greg's been here. I think this is his seventh time with his family. You know, you, I remind you, if you hang around here very long, John, uh, we'll love you. won't let you go anywhere else. Amen. So, But if you are a guest, I see some first-time guests with us. Welcome this morning to the Lord's house. Our prayer is this morning that the Lord would visit you and visit us as we come to his house this morning. Amen. But if you're a guest, please take a moment to fill out a guest card. They're at the backs and the different tables and things. Perhaps someone will give them to you. But we'd, we'd want you to know that we're happy you're here. And we so encourage you to uh, fill one out so we can connect with you and uh, begin a journey of conversation, get to know you. Of course, Brother Matt is uh, not here this morning. And his presence is always seen and it's always felt. And he always makes a difference wherever he's at. And he's with his family this week. And and so you be in prayer with him in this time if you will do that. We're going in our Bibles this morning, and I invite you to join us. We're going to the, uh, the book of Acts this morning, chapter number 13. Acts chapter 13 in your Bibles this morning. <clears throat> We're going to take a moment to read that text and that story found in the book of Acts. And uh, we're going to allow the Lord to open his word and make it alive to us. If you have a Bible, we encourage you to bring it, and <clears throat> we welcome you to open it and follow along with us. We are a Bible people. We do believe in the wisdom of men, and we, we are grateful for that. President Zelensky, I think, has some real wisdom and courage, and we enjoy the wisdom and the courage of others. And, uh, uh, but there's nothing like the Word of God. Nothing can take the place of the Word of God, and, and so it is the directions for our lives. All of our songs and singing and singers direct us to those ways, but we always go back to that place of the Word of God. If you found your place, would you stand with us in the reading in honor of the Lord and of his words? In verse 1, I read these words. Now there was in the church that was at Antioch. That is going to be my location, my text. That's going to be where we'll visit completely. But as I talk... As I read, we'll find the stories that unfolds. Now there was in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets as teachers and Barnabas and Simeon, which is called Niger and Lucas of Cyrene and Manian, which has been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. So it lists for us these five names. It tells some about their teaching, where they are from. It tells who they are brought up with. And some of them even use their unsaved name. But nonetheless, there was five that were giving there. Those people were in the church. And then it says, And they ministered to the Lord, that church, and they fasted. And the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them, and they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed in Selica. And from thence they sailed to Cyprus. When they were in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. Now, Father in heaven, in our prayer, directed to the heavens in Jesus' name, we invite you in your fullness to speak in these moments. We invite you as we place ourselves into your hand for direction of the choice of our words. We invite, Lord, your precious Holy Spirit to work among us, that every one of us would be visited by the very presence of God. And, Lord, we've been in wonderful services in the journeys of our life, but those services that we need the most is when your presence is so very real. So we welcome you. We pray, Lord, if there be any sin in any life of any heart that would grieve your presence, that we be convicted of that, and we prepare ourselves for the preaching and listening to your word. We pray, Lord, that we would clean ourselves and make ourselves clean vessels. We pray, Lord, if there's a man, a woman, a young person in this moment that realizes that they need you as Savior, I pray that before they go any farther in this service, that in their silence, 
the quietness of their prayer, that they would give their soul in forgiveness to you. Dear Lord, have your way now, and we'll love you and thank you in Jesus' name, and amen. And all the people said, amen. amen. Thank you. Be seated, please. Now there was in the church that was at Antioch. Wow, what a statement. You know, the Bible is very clear that it gives to you and I tremendous stories in the communication that God has with his churches. If we visit the Revelation, the book of Revelation, we find in those first three chapters it talks about the seven churches. After the third chapter is concluded, the raptures take place and the, churches, the local church has never been mentioned again. But it's interesting of the church. Every church is different. They're different because of who they are and where they are. They're different because of the continuity of the people that come together. And they form and they make a different church than any other church in all of the world. And so not only is your voice unique and distinct, and always the print of your finger unique and distinct, so my friend, every church has uniqueness about it. However, I want you to know, as we think about this church at Antioch, we're going to get there in a minute, but let me just give you, give you the feeling of my heart, if I can say this. If you'll take time today, or in your convenience, and read and study these churches, these seven churches, you find that the messages that are given to us about those churches are remarkable. John is, first of all, gives to us from the inspiration of God the, 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 the church at Ephesus. Now, it says about the church of Ephesus that it was a patient church. Two times it said it was patient, on purpose God. So I'd say that if you'd walk in the church at Ephesus, you would say, this is a gracious people. This is a kind people. When you come to the church of Ephesus, when you leave, you'd say they'd be a good people. They were a gracious people. But they, took, they were people, my friend, the church at Ephesus, that took a stand on doctrine. They said that there were some people said that they were apostles. I'm one of the 12 apostles. I'm one of God's apostles. They said that they tried him and found him not and found them to be liars. So yes, they were soft and they were a gracious church, but they were a church that would draw a line in the sand and say, no, 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 you are not scriptural in that stand. And so they were a church, my friend, that, that, that drew a line. But there was something else the Lord says to that angel, that pastor. And that is that he said that, that you're a changing church. He didn't say that they lost their first love. It said that they left their first love. So it was interesting that that church at Ephesus, if you went into it and you watched and felt it, you'd see that it was a changing church. They had everything about it in order, but one thing that had happened, they'd walked away from their love with the Lord. We got some more to go through, so I can't spend a lot of time. The church of Smyrna, it was a poor church. If you walked into their buildings, the grass probably wouldn't have been kept as way. The shrubs probably were very simple, if any. Um, the church would have the oldest style. Uh, it would have, I'm not sure what that would be, but in that era or our era, if we compare it, it would be a very, very poor, they were a poor people. The Bible said they were in poverty, but God says about that church of, of Smyrna, that it was a, but they were poor physically, but they were a rich church. So they were, you, you walk into that church of, of Smyrna, and you feel and you sense that they have a people that have walked with God. They're rich. But they, they, they didn't have an easy church. It said that they were in time of tribulation, and they were suffering, and there were people that would die that were in their congregation as martyrs. So there was a lot of things that that church had that my friend might be a little rough, might not be as comfortable as some others. They were in a tribulation time and era. Their, some of their ch church members would die as martyrs. It, it's interesting what God says about that spirit of that church. Then the church of Pergamos, it says, I know where the seat of Satan is. Well, that's interesting. He comes to church here every Sunday, do you know that? But it's interesting that he took up, now listen to this, he had a place where he regularly sat in that church of Pergamos. Boy, that's it. I know where Satan, Satan's seat is. Wow. So they had challenges inside that church that that church family would have to deal with. That's interesting. He said they were faithful, and they did not deny the faith. He said that some of the martyrs of the church of Pergamos as well would die as martyr. But he had a real problem with them. And he said that they had wrong doctrine. He said they carried the doctrine of, of Balaam. And they, they carried the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. 
And so that church was a different church. So Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, different, a different spirit, a different church, completely. The church of Tyra, Tyra. They were a generous church. They were a giving church. Talks about them that they were patient. They were not, not in a people to hurry. That means that they, they were not legalistic. They would allow people to grow as and where they were. All of us come in at different levels. And the place where I was saved was different than the place that you were. In life's journey, you might have been ahead of me in life's journey at the age and place I was in life. Or you might have been behind. It doesn't make any difference. This church was a church that gave people time to grow. I love that kind of people. I love that spirit. Uh, I, I would personally be, just because I'm a man, uh, when you would push me in any level, I would stop. You might be 100% right, but I would probably stop. Uh, don't get in my face, but allow me to hear the word of God. Allow the word of God to work with me. Allow me to grow with Jesus. That's the kind of people I want to be around. That's the kind of church I believe that Jesus wants. The church of Tyra, Tyra. It was a generous, it was a patient church. Talked about their works. They were a working church. And they did more than they did at the first. And so their intensity, my friend, was very interesting. But now, though they had these credentials about them, he said that you're the church of Jezebel. And he said your doctrine is wicked. Now think about that. You say, Pastor Lamb, do they still, does the Lord still recognize a church that's completely doctrinally away from this word, away from the word of God? Does God still recognize the church? He did in the book of Revelation. That's very interesting. He said, uh, your doctrine's wicked. Take time to read it and study. You read and study about that church, and most of the members of that church were unsaved. You say, Pastor, what do you say? I'm saying that if you'll study it, that church, he said, is going through the tribulation. The Christian church, my friend, the born-again people, are not going through the tribulation. They're going up in the rapture before the tribulation begins. Now, I conclude that that was a church my friend, that was unsaved. Most of the people are unsaved. You know, I, I, uh, I do a test on preachers. You don't tell them. Preachers are always pretty clever and smart. And if I'm questioning a man if he's saved or not, I ask him this story. Just, hey, just tell me, the sto- tell me your story when you were saved. And when they start bubbling and, 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 and stammering and st- 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 stuttering around, you know they got a problem with their salvation. And you know, after I got saved, and I went back to the priest that was directing me spiritually, my family. I asked him that question. He couldn't answer it. I'm saying this church, my friend, was a church of most of the church members were unsaved. Not all of them, but most of the church members unsaved. They're going through the tribulation. Wow. The church of Sardis. I could stop and speak on any of them. But it says about this church, if you walk into their church, the numbers would probably be small. But the people were very shallow. They could pray publicly, but you wouldn't hear them praying privately very much. You'd watch them carrying a Bible, but you'd never see them reading a Bible. The Bible said about that church of Sardis, they were weak. Now watch this. They were weak and ready to die. How dry do you think that church? Pretty dry, wouldn't you think so? He said, now, now pastor, he said, the angel of the church at Sardis, he said, I want you to know that you are weak. You need to know it. And your church is ready to die. There's hardly any life left in it. Wow. Wow. He goes on and talks about that their works, their works were not perfect. The last church, different. But this church, the works are not good. And there is few people saved there. Not all the people are lost, but few people. Read it and study. The church at Philadelphia, first thing he says to that church, he said, I've set before you an open door. I've set before you an open door. Nobody can shut that door. I will open it. Go through it. He said, you guys have got a little strength. He said that you're a church that keeps God's word. He said, you guys aren't going through the tribulation. I conclude that that church, my friend, is filled with saved people, but they were just very weak. They were not strong. They all held us, and they were a church that struggled. And the last church, and we'll go to my message this morning. The last church is a church of Laodicea. It's interesting. He said about that church, if you'd walk into that church, you'd say, that's good. But there's no sincerity here. There's no, uh, I hear the words, I listen to the songs, I know the notes are being played, but there's something different. And he says about that church, a late in certain church, my friend, they're not hot, neither are they cold. They're just in between. 
They were just who they were, but there was nothing there of urgency. There was nothing there of life. And Jesus said, I would spew you out of my mouth, like taking something that you put to our lips that we expect, anticipate to be warm, and it's not warm at all. It's just, and you just, yuck, it's just not. Jesus said, that's the way I feel about your church. You know, it's interesting that, they were, that their thinking was wrong. He said that church, that church at Laodicea, they said that they were rich and had no needs at all. Now, if you walked into that Laodicean church, my friend, every, everything would be of the best. Everything would be fashionable. Everything would be current. Everything would be up to order. They would have only the best of, of the seating, of the carpeting, of, of, of the instruments. They'd have the best of the lighting, have the best of everything. But then he said, you say your thinking is wrong. You, you're rich and you have no needs. But he said, I, I want you to know that you're, you're wretched and you're poor and you're blind and you need to beg me for my presence in your life. And then he invites them to allow him to come into the church. Now, the church at Antioch, the church at Hillsborough. Who are we? Should a church ever as a church address themselves and listen to themselves and look at themselves? You find that these seven messages were not given to the church. They were given to the preacher. <laughs> that's interesting. You see what's different about a, a man that's ordained, called by God, and put in a church? And any other good Bible student or a good Bible teacher is simply this. Is that God, my friend, reserved the message that he would give to that church would be given to that pastor. Very interesting, but it's a truth that's unshakable and unchangeable. It's very unique and very different. And so all those messages were not given to the church. They're given to the pastor that he should give to the church. Should we ever come to a place honestly before the Spirit of God and say, now what kind of servant am I? What kind of a church are we? What am I making? What am I causing to happen in this church? Ooh, man, how many of you say, Pastor, hurry up and go on quick. Go ready to do with that one, huh? Amen. Now there was a church at the church of Antioch, okay? That's where I'm going to focus, okay? Now there was at, the, excuse me, there was in the church at, that was at Antioch. Antioch was a very large city. It was a city where Christians were first called Christians in the city of Antioch. It is a home base of so many very mission adventures. It was a place that we first find God calling missionaries and sending them out around the world. The church at Antioch was, if you please, birthed in a place, my friend, where the church or the community or the city, Antioch, was responsive to the gospel. And they re responded to the Lord readily, and they, and, and, and they just wanted to do what God wanted them to do. It's interesting that when God talks about the church at Antioch, he doesn't talk about their curbside appeal. He doesn't talk about the style of their building. He doesn't talk about the comfort of their chairs. He doesn't talk about the acoustics in the building. He doesn't talk about, he doesn't talk about anything in regards to of the outside or the inside of a building. He always talks about the people. Can I say that the church is a people? Can you say amen? amen. The church is you and me. Can you say amen? amen? That's what God has. That's what God plans. That the church, and what's really important is not the bricks or the mortar. It's really not. Or the carpet of the pews or the sound of the lights, or if it's brick, if it's steel, if it's wood, it's, that's, that, them things, my friend, are completely immaterial to what God's interested in and concerned about. He said, now there were in the church that was at Antioch, they were in the church that was Antioch, what was in there was people. People. You are important to the Lord. People is important to the Lord. People. The souls of men is important. Those that God created my friend, on purpose, for purpose, people, you and I are important. So first of all, I want you to know that there was in the church that was in Antioch, there was a people. And my friend, unless you have a people, you don't have a church. You can have a building, but you don't have a, you don't have a, you don't have a church. You see, you can have all the structures and all the buildings, but if you don't have people, you don't have anything. There's nothing. The most important thing is people. People are so important. Not only did it say they were a place of people in the church, they were people that were unnamed people. Now, I want you to catch this, and I want you to get this point. We won't visit here long. But there were unnamed people. In specific, God named people. But there was a people in that church of Antioch that were not named. It doesn't tell if they're girls or guys, men or women. It doesn't say that. There were just a people there, my friend, that was unnamed. It's very interesting. 
And those unnamed people will be those people that don't have a voice and they don't sing. And they're not a song leader and they don't play an instrument. And you'd look around and you could never, ever see them. But they're there and they're the backbone. They're the strength. They're the life, my friend, of a church. There's an unnamed people. You know, yesterday in honor of Timmy and Raymond Brownie, there was a lot of hands that were about that time in that service and memorials. But you know what? You didn't see them. You probably didn't even hear them, but they were there. They did all different kinds of things to make the church what it needs to be. It's interesting, there, was an unnamed, there were people that were unnamed. And then there was a people that were named. There was a people that were named. Some were unnamed, but it gives us a list of five of those names. So some will be visual, some you will see, some you will know about, some you will hear about. But my friend, no matter which side, the unseen or the seen, you heard about or didn't hear, it doesn't make any difference. There was a people of that church that were a people that came together in unison and work and body and, and energy, my friend, to produce that church. Now, and then it says this. Now, here's where it gets, starts to get fun. There was a church that was filled with people, that were, and there, these people were in the church at Antioch. Um, Phyllis is sitting over here. We changed her name to the buzzard lady. She's feeding a buzzard, and, and she just, uh, just it's, it's interesting. She asked the Lord for something to do, and so he sent a crippled buzzard, and so she, you know, you get hungry, that buzzard's eating better than I'm eating sometimes. I mean, go to Phyllis's house, okay. But her husband, Jack, was interesting, and he's always driving somebody here or there, and his driving record was oh, maybe a little better than mine. I'm not sure. But anyhow, he was carrying one of their friends, um, Miss Green and uh, Mabel Green, and they were out here in this section. They were going through the drive through in that area there, and he was picking her up. Well, all of a sudden, he took off. The only problem was that Mabel Green wasn't all the way in. And as, as Phil tells it, she said, it's like the Lord laid her down. She just don't want to load right down. And then he run over her. You know, he just run over her. Not all of her, just a piece of her, you know. And I said to Ed, I said, brother, why did you run over her? You know what she, he told me? He said, she should have got in the car. Amen. She should have got in the car. If you're with me, get in the car, amen. amen. The Bible said that, that about this Antioch church, he said that they were in the church. Now, now that's interesting. They were in the church. Not partly in. Not most of the way in. Not some of the way in. They were already, they're in the church. They were in the church, amen. That's interesting. You say, Pastor, how do you get it? I'm greeted at the front door, I open, and I come in, I walk in and find my place, and I sit down. You know, Baptists are just like a bunch of laying hens. You know, they got a place that they like to lay in. They're... <laughs> now, I, you forgive me some of my words and my goof-off stuff, but here's the way I look at it. I feel like a Baptist or like that chicken, you know. But they sat in a place so long that it's shaped like them and smells like them. They're, don't take that off. Don't shut, let anybody hear that, Kevin. But that's only, but can I say that I believe that God wants us to get in the church? You know, that's why I believe that uh, some things are very, very important. And I think to have a church that is yours is so very important. I believe that with all of my being. Not to be partially in, or some of the way in, but be all the way in. And there was in the church that was in Antioch, my friend, there was a people. They were seen some, some were not, but for sure they were in. Say, Pastor, okay, so if I don't get in the church by walking through a door, setting where I'm supposed to sit, how do I get in the church? You get in the church by being saved. You know, the place to begin is to be saved, to know Jesus as your Savior. And if you're going to ever be able to fit into a church and enjoy the singing of the songs and be able to sing with us, then you're going to have to have, be saved because that song comes from the heart of a man and that love... For the church, my friend, comes because you're saved. That's the reason. You ought to get in the church by being saved. You ought to get in the church by following the Lord and believers' baptism. Bristol is going to be saved this morning. The first time her mom and daddy, the McCracken family, came to the church was last Easter time at the egg drop. And, of course, that's an entry. Watch now. It's an entry that we use to get people in and tell them the story of Jesus, make friends, and connect. And so now we got the second step of that family. Mom and daddy say baptized. Now my friend, their baby girl, Bristol, being baptized this morning. What are you saying? I'm saying that my friend, to get in the church is not coming to the door and finding a seat. It's to come to know the Lord. It's to follow him in believer's baptism. And it's to learn how to give. 
Giving is growing. Giving is growing. You know, it's growing. It's enabling, my friend, God to work through you. You know, I, I love to be generous. I just love to do that. I, I enjoy that. I just, I enjoy that part and piece of life as I can when I can. I love to do that. But, you know, it'd be nice for me to go give to the neighbors, which I have in times of their need. I've gave to them. You know, that's, but I, I'm not going to take the money that, that would buy groceries at our house and give it away unless I first take care of our house. I'm saying give. And that you get in the church, my friend, by serving. By serving, you get, my friend, in church by serving. You get in the church, my friend, by allowing it to take a, take a place in your life, a place, my friend, that God designs. And then I go along quickly in my message. Point number three, I'm doing good. It's a long three-pointer, isn't it, huh? But I got some more points. So don't, don't push your automatic oven and turn it on yet, okay? Don't do that, okay? There was a people that could be seen. And it was very clear, my friend, that they had a testimony about the Lord. Barnabas and Simeon of Niger and Lucas from Cyrene and Mannion and then Saul, the unsaved man. There was, a, there was a people that could be seen. There was a people that were really there. There were people that were there in attendance. It's interesting that church, my friend, was a place, my friend, where people could be seen. And, and God said, okay, now they're going to come on my day. They're going to come to my place, the place where I've chose to put my name there. They're going to come there and they're going to be a people, my friend, that are going to be seen. A little lady had grown very old, old, old in life, and she'd lost all of her ability to hear. And she was almost completely bind. And she always begged someone that they would come and take her to church. One day, one of those folk that picked her up and brought her to church asked the question, Claire was her name, Claire, why is it that you come to church? You can't hear what the pastor says. You can barely see, Claire. Why do you come to church? And she replied, I want everybody to see that I love the Lord and I want to serve him. Can I say the church at Antioch, my friend, was a church, my friend, of the people that were seen, the people that had names to them. There were people, my friend, that made the church what it was. The church at Antioch was a good church. It was a leading church. It was a powerful church. And then there were a church, my friend, that loved the Lord. They just loved the Lord. Please, please never come to church here. Never come unless... You can enjoy the fellowship, you can enjoy the song, you can enjoy your brothers and sisters, you can enjoy everything and all things we do. I like to live, I like to play, but one thing I don't want you to do, never come unless you come and connect with the Lord every time you come. In your own prayer, in your own quiet heart, in the singing of your songs, make them your songs. You know, make it you in your relationship with the Lord. There are people that love the Lord. Leonardo da Vinci, my friend, as you know, he's known as a, an amazing, an amazing artist. And he had ability to print things, my friend, that, that you have in your home and I have in mine, and we still, we still enjoy him. The greatest painting of all was the painting of the Lord's Supper. What I did not know, I didn't, as I began to study that years ago, I didn't realize how long it took him to make that painting. I never realized that he would get a, a person to come in and sit down, and by his study of the scripture, he would, he would paint, my friend, he would paint that picture, and he tried to find that person that would fit his image of what he thought the Bible taught about this Bible character. If it was John, if it was Peter, and so he'd get somebody. I never realized that. I never really realized this, but did he come to a place where it, the, the painting was almost finished, and as and when he did, he brought in his, one of his very best friends and said, okay, now I'm going to reveal to you my painting of the Last Supper, and I want your opinion. I want you to tell me honestly what you think. Leonardo said, okay, now what do you think, as he unveiled it. And he began to talk in his elaborate words how beautiful the painting of the Last Supper was. And he said, especially that silver goblet on that table. He said, when I look at it, I'm just... I'm just overcome by the beauty and the way you would taken paints and make that stand out so clear. He said, I'm, I'm mem memorized with it. I, I, I can't get my eyes off it. He was very grateful and he was a gracious man and sent his friend away. And as soon as he left, Leonardo took his paints back out and painted over the silver goblet. 
When he was asked why, he did a true. Now, this is true. He, said, he, asked, he was asked, well, why did you paint over that silver goblet? You know what he said? He said, because Jesus, Jesus needs to be the focus of this table of the Lord, Lord's Supper. Can I say that that church at Anak was a church, my friend, that was literally my friend. They never lose focus. They never lost focus, my friend, on the Lord. Let's never lose focus from the Lord. Can you say amen? amen. We must do that. And then, then there were people, there were people that, could, that God could work with. <laughs> that church at Antioch was a people, my friend, that were hungry hearts. They come in, my friend, with their hearts wide open. They come in, my friend, with willingness, like our songs were, were leading us in, as we hear. They were a people, my friend, that were a people that were ready. Can I say, it was interesting, my friend, that these people were a people that God could still work, work with. Can I say that I still want to be a pastor that's a pastor, my friend, that God can still work with and do as he will and as he wants, when he wants, and when he wants to do it. Not only would he work with them, but he'd work through them. And some of those people, he'd want to go far, farther. You know, some of us need to go farther in our walk than others. You know, all of us need to be willing to go as far as God would have us go. No matter what it costs no matter how far away it is, and no, no matter what the spiritual rate fruit is. Some of us need to go farther. Miss Julie York, I, she was telling me where her husband was this morning. I said, I talked to him last week, and he was in Missouri. Evangelist. Can I say that you are not exempt? And a church, my friend, of Antioch, the church of Jesus Christ, needs to be a church when every man that walks in here is still open to whatever God would lead him to do in his life. Every woman that walks in my friend, needs to be available and willing to do whatever God would work through in their life. Some of us need to go farther. Not everybody is willing, but some of us need to go farther. We just need to be willing to go farther. I'm going to read my little bullet points. I'm going to review them one more time. Brother Adam, one more time. All of us need to be willing to go as far as God would have us to go. Watch this, no matter what it costs, <laughs> no matter how far away it is, and no matter what fruit it will bring. I was talking to a young man, I was very concerned about him because God is working his heart to go a country where a few, few people are being saved. It's a very hard country because I have a compassion for certain nations in my own heart. I just have a compassion. I've seen the openness of souls and lives, and I tried to persuade him, and finally this young preacher reached up his hand and said, Pastor, I see you have compassion for Asia. And I said, I truly do. He said, but God sent me to maybe one or two or five or ten or twenty or thirty. What I'm trying to say is, a pastor hears the number of people he's had in his church, and he's never satisfied with that. You know why? Because a pastor does not become satisfied by the numbers on a paper. He becomes satisfied by reaching the souls of people in this community. So, you know, you, we might have the best. We might have good. But can I say there's always a somebody. There's another So There's another family. There's somebody else. So, my friend, no matter what, there are people, my friend, that God could work with. Let's be people that God can with, work with. Would you say amen? amen? They were a people of the word. I'm going to go quick now. They were a people of the word. It said in that church in Antioch, and when they had, they were in Salem, so they preached the word of God in the synagogues. They were a people of the word. They were a people of the word. We would never want anybody to feel uncomfortable if you didn't have a Bible. But if you get saved, and you're serious about serving the Lord, then you get you a Bible. You get your copy of the word of God, because that's what we're going to use. That's where we're going to stay. We're going to stay in the Word of God. Amen? That's where we're going to stay. Gene Denry, probably one of the orneriest guys I've ever personally won to Jesus, got saved. I said, now, Gene, you need to get your Bible. So I got one. Okay? So what do you got, Gene? I got the family Bible on the table. The first Sunday he walked in this church, he's in heaven now. You know what he had? Big old family Bible underneath his arm, man. Amen. Loved it, man. I loved it. I loved it. You know, God loved it too, don't you think so? Amen. Amen. People of the word. People of the word. Charles Haddon Spurgeon was pe preaching in a great, great crowd of people. 
He went to do the sound check early in the afternoon before he began the service in the night. Nobody was there, him and the sound man, nobody. All the chairs, everything was placed. Nobody else could be seen visually in the building. He got up to make the sound check. He made one statement. He said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Sound man gave him the thumbs up. He gave the sound man the thumbs up. He walked back out. That night, that night, before the service began, two men walked in. One was a man. Well, both of them were in the rafters that he didn't know was in the building, nor he could see. Both of them were there. Both of them were there. The man said, I heard you today quote the word, and I was saved in these rafters of this building this afternoon. The word of God is powerful. Preachers are good. It's nice if you get a good-looking preacher like me. Isn't that good? Amen? That's a little weak now. We've got to think about that. We've got to work that a little bit. You know, no matter what that pastor looks like, no matter if he's young or old, there's some men that I've enjoyed listening to. Some are a little harder than others. Some are easier to follow. Can I say that it's nothing about the man. It's all about his word. Amen? Don't ever forget that. It's a truth from the word of God. And lastly, and I'm going to be done, they were a people of urgency. Listed in these five men, there was one man, his name was listed, and his unsaved name was given, Saul, which we change into Paul. If your Bible is close, Romans chapter number 9, there are people of urgency. There are people of urgency. They were a people of urgency. That church of Antioch, without question, my friend, was a people of urgency. It was interesting that I see no delay in the response of the people when God began to work with them. As soon as God spoke, as soon as God directed, as soon as they had clarity what God's will was, they set out to do it right away. There was a church of urgency. I mean, they were conscious, they were waiting, they were wanting. And now Paul goes along and he shares that. I want to give that to you, chapter 9, as you find your place. We find that he opens his heart now. We find that we see what was what made that church of Antioch a great church. We see the heart of men in this church. And so here Paul, here Saul, he says these words. He said, I say the truth in Christ. He said, I, I'm telling you that Christ, no, I'm telling you the truth in Christ that I, I don't lie. He said, my conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. He said, I'm not only telling you my words in Christ, but inside of my, my conscience bears me witness in the Holy Ghost. He said that I have a heaviness. I have a great heaviness. And I have, it never goes away, a continual sorrow in my heart. He said it's a peace and it's a part of me. And it's, there's no doubt about it. There's no question about it. It's in me. It's a part of me. My conscience, it's a weight about my heart. He said, I could not wish that for myself. I could not, excuse me, I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ, for my brethren, for my kinsmen, according to the flesh. He said, I wish I could take the place of my brethren. I wish I could step aside for my salvation and give it to them that they could be saved. Chapter number 10, the next chapter, verse 1. Brethren, brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer, my prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Can I say that that church at Antioch was filled with men that were men, my friend, of urgency? You know, few things in life have I ever become urgent about. Few things. Few things. Very few things. We had moved to a, to a different home, and we were building a building. We were building the Family Life Center at that time. Not this building, so it would be the second building. And my youngest son, Stephen which is here this morning, and we're glad that he's here. And uh, my son Stephen was about four, maybe, I don't know, a little, I'm not sure, back in 80, we have to figure those numbers out. But so he come out, Brother Charles Keene was our guest, we were having a revival, and he come out and wanted if he'd go to church early with me. And I kind of in a hurry, and I said, no, well, he'd ask Brother if he could go out and ride with me, and that was the deal, that he was riding with me. Well, I... I kind of put him off. I had to go, so he didn't go back in the house. He went over the hill and got some worms. You know, that's, that's part of being a Baptist, amen? A little boy, you go after some worms. It's in the spring of the year, so he's after the worms. Well, mother comes out knowing that her son has gone with me. 
And can I see our good men? Man, I, I just want to tell you, I love you. I, I can remember seeing Dean Throckmorton in the back of that building. I see they were doing something. I could see something was not right. They didn't come to me. They didn't tell me anything. I could just tell things were, something was going down, and I, I just enjoyed the service and let our men handle that. And so it was as that we're looking for our four-year-old son, Stephen. We just moved in the neighborhood a couple weeks before, so they don't, maybe in three or four weeks, I'm not exactly sure how that timeline, so we wanted to make a good impression on our new neighbors, you know, and, uh, and so then Shuggy comes to the platform. She's only done that a couple times in, in my home ministry, and uh, this is one, and she walks right up onto the platform and said, we cannot find your son. Man, spring of the year, so Gary Sharp goes to my house and checks the creeks, boys and water, and you know how all that goes. Nobody could find him, you know. So they're trying to find our lost son, N have no idea. We're good parents. We just don't know where he is right at the moment. Actually, good parents, you know. The phone rings at the church, and uh, the lady says, I, of course, I didn't receive the message, said, you know, we're not sure, uh, but we found this little boy walking down the road, and he said his mother and daddy left him. That's a good impression on the new neighbors. And mother and dad left him. And that he goes to the Bible Baptist Church. And he said that he was walking. He was on his way to church. Amen. Now that's a good little Baptist. Don't you think so? Amen. Can I say I was urgent? You know, Shiggy walks to the platform. Whoa. If she comes up and stands me, I can still remember the... The pew is clear as a day if Shuggy is panicked inside of her and she brings it to my ears and nobody else, can I say she is urgent? You know, there's the people, my friend, that live their life in urgency. Some of them prepare their whole, we got people here and we appreciate that, amen, we appreciate their, their urgency. Now, Brother John, if you get real sick and you need mouth to mouth, nobody else will volunteer and you look to me, say, I'm going to go to heaven or I'm going to die. Brother John, just tell the Lord you'll be there in just a minute. Won't you do that? <laughs> but we got some people that, are, that live their life, by friend, by urgency. How many have ever had urgent moments in your life where you said, wow. Uh, boy, you never forget them, do you? But now watch. This church had become a people, that, my friend, that chose to be a people that would live in urgency and concern and care about other people. Wow, they deliberately, on purpose, chose to live a life of urgency. And the urgency, my friend, is that literally that they would care for people and they'd make it a priority in a place in their life. Few people would be lost today if they had somebody that was urgent about them to be saved. I, if I attended a church, I'd, I'd want to attend a church where that pastor is urgent about me. If I attended a church, I wanted to be a church where the pastor cared about my kids. If I was a part of a church, I'd want a church, to my friend, that not only a pastor, but all the leadership was urgent about it. If they weren't urgent about the Lord's work and the Lord's service and the souls of men, then I'd want them to step down on those places of leadership. I'd like to go to a church where the Sunday school teachers walk in and the little guys and little girls all about them in all different sizes and all ages, where that teacher is urgent. And if that teacher wouldn't be urgent, I'd want that teacher to step down and move away and let someone else step in with urgency. Can I say that you and I must realize that we must live, we're living a life of urgency. That's what it's about. It's important. It's eternally important. My friend, it's generationally important. My friend, it's important to lives and people and all around us. And it is that, my friend, that we might be safe. We've got to quit. Our time's up. Your time isn't, but my time's been up, so I better quit. Love you this morning. We actually choose who we become by the decisions, listen to this, by the decisions we make right now. Think about that. You say, Pastor, no, no, no. Yes, yes, yes. You see, I can't become without you. You can't become without me. 
the entirety of that body, that entirety of that body concludes who that church is, who it is, who it is. So let's conclude in your simple decision by saying, yes, Lord, I am available. Yes, Lord, you can work with me today. Yes, dear God, you can direct me. I'm willing to go as far as you want me to go, God. Whatever, how far do you want me to go? Yes, God, I'm, I'm willing to lay down that. I'm willing to take that away from my life. Yes, God, I am willing, Lord. I'm willing to pull away the layers of my heart and let you get down to that soft place again. I am. Be willing this morning. Would you stand with me? Please stand. Our Father, we are thankful, so very thankful for so much truth that you give us from your word. Lord, this has been a long message. Lord, use your holy word in our lives and our hearts. Bless those, Lord, that are preparing for baptism this moment. Bless, Lord, as you work about the hearts and souls of men. Have your way, we pray. While our heads are bowed and eyes are still closed for just a minute, if you could say right now, if you could say this very minute, Pastor, I don't have any question, I don't have any doubt, I am saved. Would you just lift your hand that I might share that blessing that I could share with you and celebrate? Thank you so much. I wonder how many can say, Pastor, I am not, but I know I need to be. Pastor, I want to be saved. Would you just lift your hand and allow me to see that? Allow me to be able to pray with you. Pastor, I am not certain of my eternal soul's destiny. But I'd like to be, I want to be, Pastor. See my hand and pray for me that I would be saved. Pray for me. You just lift your hand. Lift it straight from your heart. Father, thank you for your wonderful love for mankind. Lord, I didn't see a hand. That doesn't mean they didn't raise it. That doesn't mean they don't care. But I would pray for the soul of men, each one. I pray, Father, now you'd bless in this invitation, as we respond to you, might we be willing to put aside, to put away, to make right things you point to our heart about. Have your way with us now, and we'll love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, and amen. We begin this invitation song as we do. I wait in the front to meet you. Maybe this morning you need to be saved. Maybe you need to follow the Lord in believer's baptism, like Bristol will do in just a minute. Maybe this morning it's not salvation. Maybe it's, not, maybe it's church membership. Maybe it's somebody that you need to pray for. Maybe that's something that God speaks to your heart about. Say yes to the Lord, won't you? Say yes to him. I'll wait for you about the front. Come as you, as you need. Come, be with the Lord. Narrow as the road may seem I'll follow where your spirit As my life may be, I will give you every piece. I hear you call, I am available. I say, Yes, Lord. As the Lord moves about our service to our hearts and lives, sometimes God's waiting for our answer. We heard, we know, He's waiting for our answer. Say yes. We sing another stanza. Say yes to the Lord. Here I am with open hands, counting on your grace again. Of me and more of you. I just want to see you move. I hear you call. I am available. I say. For the one
one who gave me life. Nothing is a sacrifice. Use me how you want to, God. Have your throne within my heart. Good morning to you. It's great service with you. Great message. I just want to take some time just to let you know what's coming up. Of course, we have a big event coming up just two weeks away. Easter egg drop is going to be here. And then we have an Easter Sunday immediately following that celebrating our risen Savior. And so I want to tell you this. This is really what it is for you. It is Easter weekend at Hillsborough Bible Baptist Church. And that's what I want to tell you. I want you to tell your friends. That's why I want you to tell your neighbors and your family members that need to be here for this. Of course, our egg drop is going to be at that 2 o'clock on that Saturday, April 16th. Now, this Saturday, this Saturday, we have an egg stuffing at 10 a.m. That is an amazing time to just come together as a family, as a church family, and just really we just get a time to just hang out fellowship with each other, and stuff some eggs with candy. And so now I do have a challenge for you. I looked out there just now. We have no candy out there. All right? And so the challenge is tonight, you better bring a bag of candy or we're going to have candy to stuff this Saturday. All right? So get out there. Bring some candy with you. Please be a part of that and just uh, love on those kids that are going to be here April 16th by bringing candy and uh, having that prepared for us so we can stuff and get that ready to go. We will be stuffing some scriptures in. So if you want to be part of that, we're going to be stuffing scripture into those eggs this Saturday as well as candy, and we'll be working on some prize tickets. But we have about 8,000 eggs to go to reach our goal, and so we have one egg stuffing that's scheduled left, and we might have some surprise egg stuffing so coming up to make sure we reach that. But if we reach it this week, this Saturday, I'm all for it, all right? Amen, we're good to go. Uh, but uh, come out, 10 a.m., egg stuffing, and then Easter weekend is coming. That's going to be 2 o'clock for that Easter egg drop. If you're a volunteer, you might be there a little bit earlier, but if you haven't volunteered yet, uh, we have sign-ups over at the Welcome Center. Be a part of that. Once again, you're never more like Jesus than when you're serving others. Come serve some people on that Saturday. And then that Sunday, we have a 945 breakfast. It's going to be in the gymnasium for you. We're serving that family style and so if you need, uh, if you want to get information for that, bring your family out for that Easter breakfast. And then at uh, 1040, we'll have our regular service when we'll have a, a very special feature presentation from our praise and worship team. And uh, we'll have a great uh, presentation there for Easter. And so do not miss that. And then communion is going to be that Sunday night uh, there. So I believe that's all I have for you. Uh, everything else that uh, outside of that is going to be uh, for that oh oh there he is and then we're gonna have a baptism you guys can be seated right now okay i just went too long pastor i'm sorry you could go we're glad to have one of our young ladies here and uh we're glad for her story of her life and uh we're glad i asked you those two questions before but share it with the people have you received the lord into your heart as your own personal savior yeah in Bristol, is your desire to live for the Lord, especially from this day forward? Yes. Thank you, baby girl. Turn Hold your hands for me, won't you? As Bristol now shares her story of her life with you, her receiving Jesus as her Savior and beginning her Christian walk, it's a great joy that you share it. Bristol, in a profession of your faith, in Jesus as your Savior, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of God the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Bearing life to his death, Raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Amen. <laughs> if you'll welcome with me Bristol into the fellowship of this good church, let it be known with a heartfelt amen. Would you do that? Yeah. Amen. Well, Dan. All right, let's go ahead and pray and dismiss for afternoon. Mega praise. You guys can go ahead and get up and be dismissed to the chapel for your time together. 
But let's pray together and ask God to just bless our afternoon. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning, for the challenge uh, that you've just given to us to continue to seek and to reach out into our community and to our loved ones. I pray that we can do that this week. Take some cards for our Easter event. Take some cards for uh, just to, to share the message of Christ with others in our life. We want to hold that challenge so near and dear to our hearts that we just carry it with us every single moment of our day. Be with us even at lunch today. Bless our time and our fellowship together, but also allow us to reach out. We love you, and we thank you for bringing us back tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
I'll be in tune. Every day's a new beginning. My heart's like a tune.